Good morning, and welcome to our STEMCon keynote, Why Science is Dope, presented by Justin Schaefer. More about our speaker in a minute. But first, a few housekeeping items. This session is being recorded. Throughout the presentation, please use the Q&A function found at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. Following the presentation, Justin will answer as many of your questions as he can with the remaining time allotted. If you are viewing this presentation as a group or a class, please include your first name with your question so he can address you individually. Please also note that your mic will be muted during this webinar. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Jennifer Cumston. Dr. Cumston is the Dean of Science, Technology, Engineering and Math at College of DuPage. Previously, she was the Dean of General Studies at Gateway Technical College and a full-time faculty member in Earth Science at Oakton Community College. Good morning. A rising star in STEM education and advocacy, Justin Mr. Fascinate Schaefer is a LinkedIn top voice in technology with a talent for inspiring Generation Z. Far from camera shy, Justin has hosted science TV shows with WGBH, Travel Channel, and Al Roker Entertainment. Justin's goal to be for STEM what ESPN is for sports and to inspire young people to embrace their inner nerd despite their surroundings springs from his own life experience. Growing up in a single parent home on the south side of Chicago, he had little awareness of the potential of a STEM career. Self-taught and fascinated by science, Justice, Justin earned scholarships from NASA and NOAA that covered 100% of his tuition and room and board at Hampton University. Justin graduated with a degree in marine and environmental science, earning his department's highest GPA while also serving as student body president. Inspired to pay his success forward, Justin co-founded the STEM Success Summit, a large scale recruiting conference for diverse STEM students that secured sponsorship from Best Buy and General Motors. Kickstarting his professional speaking career with a popular TEDx talk, How to Speak to Generation Z, Justin continues to reach millions with his content, keynotes and workshops. Justin's work has been featured in ABC, Forbes, Essence, and other media. Welcome, Justin. All right. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Jennifer. So it looks like, all right, looks like my camera's up and you all can see me clearly and hopefully hear me clearly as well. Thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday morning to check me out. I'm going to be talking about why STEM is dope. So, all right, here we go. So this is me. I uh, do a lot of different things in science. I wear a lot of different hats. And here's some of the job titles that I guess I have. Uh, I'm a science TV producer and host. I've done shows with WGBH up in Boston. I've done shows with Al Roker himself. Uh, and here's me wearing a pretty cool space suit from one of the shoots that we did uh, last year. And this is me in Biosphere 2, which is a simulated Earth habitat in, in, uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, or near, near Phoenix, Arizona. I've also been a keynote speaker, like, uh, like Jennifer said, I've given TEDx talks, I've spoken to kids all over the world, I've spoken to adults all over the world, I've done commencement speeches, led science marches, I've reached over 150,000 people with speaking gigs in person uh, pre-COVID, so done a lot of different that speaking stuff, and I think the best way to describe what I actually do, though, is I'm actually a builder. I'm a person that sees problems, and I create solutions to those problems. Uh, that I care about. And if I'm not motivated to solve a problem, I found that I'm actually pretty lazy. So if I'm not building, then I'm probably just chilling. So I want to talk to you all about the state of STEM today, the state of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics today. STEM is in an interesting place, right? We're at a revolutionary time where we've got electric cars popping up. We've got artificial intelligence uh, coming around the block and, and taking over jobs. And we have engineering fields and data scientists and uh, whole businesses now starting to be run by algorithms is the future that we can look to. And so with that said, there's these opportunities that are arising for the next generation to come into STEM careers. And to understand the next generation, I think I have a pretty cool anecdote about them. Uh, so next generation coming up is called digital natives, also known as Gen Zers, born around 1996. And these are the folks that most of the time they don't remember analog technology. Shout out to uh, cassette tapes or CD Walkmans, if you all remember those at all. This generation doesn't have a lot of familiarity with that stuff, but they have a lot of familiarity with some other stuff, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but one of the cool stats about Gen Z is that they're the most racially and ethnically diverse 
so far. Actually, 48% of them identify as non-white. So as we're looking at you know, all these uh, movements to enhance and improve diversity, this isn't a trend. It's actually reflective of the population dynamics shifting in the entire contiguous United States. Uh, and then the other thing to, to be cognizant of is that Gen Alpha, which is the generation coming up after Gen Z, is actually supposed to have more of, uh, of that generation identifying as non-white than not for the first time in American history. Um, another thing to, to think about here is that Generation Z is set to be the most educated generation yet. So obviously that's in terms of uh, traditional degrees, but it's also in terms of non-traditional education, which I want to talk about some more as well. So you get an inf insightful story here about how Generation Z's mind works and uh, what kind of education that they're leaning towards getting and how that can affect uh, their context and, and the future of STEM careers. So I was doing this workshop for some kids. This was about two and a half years ago. And these are middle school kids. And the workshop was called Silicon Valley 101. So I was teaching these kids about all the innovations going on in technology out in the West Coast near San Francisco. I talked to them about Tesla and Facebook and silicon chips and how computers are being built by hand, at least originally, and now they're being mass manufactured. And pretty much everything that we use from our cameras to our phones to anything else is a computer. And these kids actually didn't know what Silicon Valley was. I mean, I pulled them at the beginning of the class. I said, raise your hand if you know what Silicon Valley is. None of them said they knew. And so at the end of them, at the end of the workshop, I always do this quiz game. It's called Kahoot. Uh, I think some of you all should be familiar with Kahoot. It's a pretty cool quiz game. And it usually really effectively engages young people. And this time it didn't work out exactly how I thought it was going to. So uh, I was, you know, passing out the devices. The kids would go on their Google Chromebooks and they would, the, the small laptops, and they would log into the Kahoot and compete against each other to answer these questions. And so uh, this was in a classroom. And so there was a big projector behind me. Remember when we used to have those back in the day? Uh, so I turned around and looked at the, the projector behind me. And I noticed that there was an error message. And every kid was laughing at me. I'm like, what are you all laughing at? What's funny about this error message? And then I looked down to see who was playing in my Kahoot. Now, there were 30 kids in this class, but the Kahoot was occupied by 9,999 players. One of them was Poophead22. The other one was Your Mama 50 I think my favorite one was Fart Daddy 44 All right, so it turned out that I actually had been hacked. There was one of the kids that decided he was going to be a class clown and impress one of the girls in class and hack into my quiz game. This is a kid that never knew what Silicon Valley was, never heard of Silicon Valley before, but knew how to hack into my quiz game. And so the dean of students came in, the dean of students was furious, he's ready to kick the kid out, and the kid's supposed to get in a bunch of trouble. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm actually impressed by this kid. You can't like out-nerd the nerd. I'm supposed to be like the main nerd here, and you've out-nerded me at, at sixth grade. So I, you know, I have to learn from you now. You have to teach me your ways. And so, of course, the reason I found out who the kid was is because it's always that one kid that's laughing a little too hard, you know, the one that just can't stop snickering. Like, it's, it's already not funny anymore, but he's still laughing. And so I asked him, I said, hey, man, you know, how did you learn how to do that? And guess what he said? He said he learned from YouTube University. He had a bachelor's and watching YouTube videos from YouTube. And that's probably not surprising if you're a parent to a Gen Zer or if you ever taught some Gen Zers that they learn how to do something random like this on YouTube, like hack into a quiz game. And so, you know, I think the most interesting part about this is that, you know, maybe some of us have learned how to do things on YouTube. I, I look back and I learned how to, remember when I was in college, I learned how to tie a tie in, on YouTube. I learned some cool handshakes on YouTube, or even if I'm learning different skills, uh, I go to YouTube to troubleshoot and figure things out. But this generation of young people has pretty much learned everything from YouTube from the time that they were born. They've never not had YouTube. They've never not had instant access to this information. And so, you know, what does that mean for us as parents, as educators, as folks that are trying to uh, pursue STEM? And, 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 you know, how are we thinking that the workforce is gonna change as a result of this new way that Gen Z's minds are working, their brains are forming, and their learning styles are adapting? So, one of the interesting things I learned, especially in the context of STEM, actually, and, and why I think I've been able to make STEM dope, is that personal brands are the new job security. And I think this resonates even outside of STEM. Uh, it's one of those things that, you know, you think about in bigger picture and you realize, wait a minute, this is everywhere. 
you know, one of the things I think about now is that everybody is Google searching everybody, right? Like, let's say you're going in for a job interview for a new job. You Google search the company, right? And hopefully if you have the employer's name, you'll learn something about the employer uh, via LinkedIn or Google search. And you'll find out how to maybe best navigate that interview. That employer is Google searching you too. And so when I'm working with kids and talking to them about how to improve in STEM, I talk to them about being searchable, being search engine accessible, S-E-A. And so here's a little bit of insight into how I learned about this. 10 years ago, I was in high school and I was one of the class clowns myself. I was one of the kids that had my thumb down and wasn't really engaged, wasn't really that interested uh, in performing in school. And this is what my report card reflected. I mean, I had bad grades in chemistry and world history and didn't really like school that much, didn't really see STEM as a career that was for me. In fact, I was such a class clown that my Twitter name was at what that booty do, right? So I completely didn't understand how to make myself marketable online or my personal brand. The one thing that happened during that time is I realized that people were always talking to me, like the people in high school, the kids would always be like, hey, what that booty do? And they would always refer to me as this name. Uh, and, and you know, obviously it was a silly thing then, but then when I ended up going to college and I actually didn't change it until a few years into college, uh, people, when they first met me, would call me what that booty do. And I never met him before. And I realized, wait a minute, I have an opportunity to use my brand to literally make a memorable impression on people's minds. And so I wasn't using it the right way here, but eventually I started turning things around, right? And I got into a science career, ended up presenting different science research proposals and figuring out how to navigate science, working in different science labs and stuff like that. And I had a pretty cool run in science. And I realized later on that I could actually turn my science interests into a brand. And so I built a computer, I started creating all this content, taught myself uh, how to do things on YouTube University and figured out how to create a studio space. And I called this studio space the Nerd Paradise. I made a bunch of cool nerdy STEM content on this place. And I ended up making a name for myself, not as what that booty do, but as Mr. Fascinate. And so as Mr. Fascinate, I got this role as the top voice in technology on LinkedIn because of the content I was creating there. And from there, I got featured on all kinds of cool platforms like Forbes and Diversity Magazine, where I was on the front cover just last year. And so all these cool things started coming my way, literally because I took that concept of branding and then I, I became, instead of what that booty do, I turned myself into Mr. Fascinate and started making myself the fun science dude. And I knew that this whole concept of branding is actually malleable, right? Me being what that booty do and having that history on the internet, you can actually undo that as long as you have a new brand that comes in that makes a bigger impact, right? Probably if employers search for me, like STEM employers and search for me and search my name in high school, they would find what that booty do and probably pass my resume along to the next. Uh, next person and, and, and ignore me entirely. Whereas in this, in this context, now if you search my name, you're going to see the whole first four pages of all the work that I've done in STEM. And so personal brands, and for that reason, are the new job security. One of the other things I learned is that STEM will give you job security anytime, anywhere, any place, right? So most of my friends that work in tech, whether they're computer scientists or in AI, they pretty much have this what's called a remote working arrangement where, I mean, we're all now familiar with that due to the pandemic, but um, they pretty much have been working remote for the past 10 years. They never have to put on clothes to go into the office. They never have to um, go to a physical office anymore because their skill set is so valuable. They can just do it from wherever they need to do it. And so for me, I, you know, I wasn't a coder by nature, but I'm a STEM guy where I learned science. I learned about um, you know, different app building and website building tools. Uh, and so I was able to leverage that knowledge to actually create sustainable employment for myself once the pandemic hit. Went. And so to give you all a little context, you know, my business, I've been a business owner for three or four years. And for me, um, you know, most of my business is predicated on like doing events for kids or doing speaking engagements or things like that, where I'm appearing in person. And so and in April 2020, when the pandemic first hit, my whole business was devastated. I was set to make most money I made for the year in April and May, and all of that completely disappeared. All the signed contracts, you know, they got postponed. And so I was like, wait a minute, what am I going to do? How am I going to use my STEM knowledge to survive? And so I ended up 
creating a voiceover business using what I knew about sound engineering, something I taught myself from YouTube. Ended up creating a STEM app. It's called Beyond. We're still working on it. It's for educating young people about STEM. I ended up using my cartoon knowledge from graphic design and animation and my science knowledge to create a STEM cartoon show where I'm exciting kids about the prospect of STEM careers. All from my brain, right? And this is not an uncommon story. There's a bunch of people in STEM that were able to just figure out their lives as a result of the skill set that they acquired. And I think that's another interesting reason as to why STEM is dope. And again, I'm not the only person out here that's figured this thing out. It doesn't matter what your background is. You can be an influential hero in STEM in a very multifaceted way. So here's a couple of folks uh, and to keep in mind. A friend of mine, Dr. Corey Grayson, she actually was getting her PhD during the pandemic and she didn't um, she didn't have a chance to walk across the stage because, you know, everything shut down before she could get her doctorate. She ended up making a viral video about it, and she ended up making a whole career outside of STEM uh, as a figure reaching people as a biomedical engineer. Uh, some people might know Kizmeki Corbett. Uh, she is the Black woman that's actually responsible for working on the Moderna vaccine uh, and, and working with the National Institute of Health and, and that collaborative process. So she's definitely going to be in books after this whole pandemic thing is over. Uh, a couple other cool people to think about, a friend of mine, Lenora Porter, she's one of those folks that from the beginning negotiated a remote work arrangement. And she's had all kinds of tech companies recruiting her from all different backgrounds. And one of my favorite diverse folks that is, is killing it in STEM is Marquez Brown Lee. He's a tech YouTuber. He's actually the biggest tech YouTuber in the world. And he's 27 years old. He reviews like smartphones and uh, different gadgets and, and hardware and different cars and stuff like that. And he has basically made a name for himself by creating YouTube videos online. So everyone now has this opportunity. As long as you have a smartphone or uh, any, any kind of device where you can upload things, even a webcam where you can upload things to the internet, you're pretty much in a position to create and change and become an influential person in the world. And so you know, one of the things that I always have to talk about, you know, I think STEM is great. There's a bunch of Big financial opportunities in STEM is opportunities to make a ton of money and a ton of impact, but you all, sometimes are the only person in the room if you have a diverse background. You know, this was a moment from my lab in, uh, research internship, and you know, I had a great time at this internship, uh, but I was the only black dude in the laboratory, and there was a lab of about 50 people, and I felt like a lot of times that I was the only black dude from 50 mile radius, and so you know, a lot of times you don't think of that as being intrinsically problematic. But, you know, I was never like a, a, a low performing student, but because I didn't have a sense of community, I just kind of didn't feel like it was worth it. It kind of felt depressing at times. And like, you know, and this happens very often is often high performing students that just don't have a sense of community and therefore don't feel like it's necessary to have that tenacity and that grit to keep moving. And so you see that statistically play out as black and Latinx students leaving STEM majors twice as much as white students. That's a, you know, a very common thing where, you know, if you don't have a community, you don't have role models to look to and you don't feel encouraged, well, you just find something else to do. I mean, there's a ton of other things that, you know, STEM folks can do. A lot of times they're, uh, you know, pretty capable folks. Uh, and so they, they turn away from these STEM majors, which could maybe make them tons of money and to also give them opportunity to make tons of impact. And some of the other things to consider here is that that plays out into the larger working population where you know, they represent a larger percentage of the working population, but only a smaller percentage of engineering workforces out there. And so this is a problem that perpetually I noticed. And I was like, I want to solve this problem because I'm a builder. I want to build sustainable solutions. And so I teamed up with folks like the folks that I mentioned uh, earlier, these diverse STEM role models. And I said, I'm going to build a community for the young people and also build role models where they can feel like they have other folks to look to that look like them in STEM. And so we created the STEM Success Summit. You know, this is a virtual summit uh, where we're giving people opportunities to do speed dating and networking and meet each other. And we got to fund it. And so that's one of the most important things about STEM is that, you know, there's all this opportunity, there's all these companies that are in STEM that have the finances to fund big ambitious projects, right? And so there's a bunch of grassroots initiatives out there that are made by diverse people like myself, but sometimes they don't have the funding to actually carry them through into fruition. And so we were able to actually fund this project and create 
uh, and therefore actually solve the problem at the scale we needed to. And that gave us some pretty cool stats. We had over 2,000 people attend this past year from 50 different countries, had 25 speakers come out, and the average person spent four hours on our platform paying attention to the summit. And so we had these cool people come out like Tatiana Lee, who's Ashley Banks from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. She also is a STEM advocate. And then Idris Sandu, who actually worked on the Marathon store for the late rapper Nipsey Hussle. So, you know, these big influential figures that do multifaceted things in STEM. And they show, show you that you can be an actress, you can be a creative person, an architect. You can have any kind of brain, but you can succeed in a STEM career if you just understand the thought process. And that's what we're teaching people. And so we actually are, are very fortunate to have Dr. Kismeki Corbett, the the uh, COVID vaccine hero and immunologist and researcher be our keynote speaker for this upcoming summit. So I'm super excited about that. But I you know, wanna show you all uh, just a few more gems to succeed in STEM, you know, as you're trying to build a dope STEM career or as you're trying to figure out, you know, best, best practices on getting into STEM or even getting your kid into STEM. One of the things that I think is super important if you're in STEM, especially if you're a scientist, if you know a scientist, you should definitely tell them this to advocate, whether that's via social media or panels or public facing means. You know, for me as a scientist, I, was come, I came into the career and I always was one of the bigger talkers, right? And so most of the folks in my laboratory were pretty introverted and, you know, they always kind of clowned me a little bit because I was like the guy that kind of talked a lot, right? And that was okay, but, um, you know, I, I think I never really felt completely secure as like someone that was a speaker because they would just be like, oh, he's just a talker. He doesn't do any work. And that's actually not the case. I think that if you're in STEM, you know, we're encouraged to be silent and not talk about the amazing things that we do. We definitely should. And I want to share uh, an interesting story about why I think this is so important. So the guy circled here with a pretty cool afro is actually my late grandfather. He passed away when I was 12 years old, but I found out that he was an electrical engineer. And I heard this growing up but I kind of didn't know, growing up in Chicago, on the south side of Chicago, I didn't know what an electrical engineer was. I thought that maybe he was like a train conductor or something like that. Like I didn't have full context on the work that he actually did. And so, you know, after he passed, I found a patent that he held. Uh, I did some Google searching on my last name because he begged my mother to, um, to basically take my last name, even though I was raised by just my mom who had a different last name from him. And so he's like, please, I need my son to have my last name. It's so important to me to carry on my legacy. And I was like, why, why, is my, you know, why is my grandfather so adamant about this? I found this patent that he held for a circuit of an early prototype in the VCR. And this is when I was around 18, 17, 18 years old. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute. This STEM stuff is in my blood. Like he was a real builder. He built real things. And that is what gave me the inspiration that I needed to then go into STEM myself. And so, you know, imagine if all the other scientists spoke up. Imagine if my grandfather just a little bit more spoke up and I'm not blaming him for not speaking up. I think it's a byproduct of the career field that he was in. You know, we're not intrinsically taught to advocate in STEM. A lot of us are just silent workers and they're doing amazing things, making a ton of money and they're not telling anyone about it. Whereas other careers like entertainment and sports uh, and acting, like they're glamorized and those people kind of, speak highly with bravado or wear cool outfits and drive fast cars. Uh, these folks, a lot of times are more humble and, and down to earth and they, you know, they don't talk about what they do, but it's so important to advocate. And one of the other things I think is super important if you're trying to go into STEM, if you're trying to encourage a kid to get into STEM, is soft skills, soft skills, soft skills. I drill this thing with kids. Every time I do a STEM camp or STEM program for high school kids, college kids, I'm always making them stand up, speak in front of me, shake my hand, introduce themselves to me, network with each other, learn about each other, talk about what they do comfortably, confidently, because that is a thing that a lot of STEM people are still missing. And, and one of those other things that we're just not taught. We don't really have, know how to move and shake in, in the boardrooms. And, um, and most STEM people, they don't think that that's important until they get into an engineering firm and they realize, wait a minute, this is actually a thing I have to do all the time. And so, you know, that's something I drill over and over again with people. So one of the things I think is super important to think about, especially for a lot of these diverse kids I, I work with who maybe can't identify, like if I told a kid, like name a chemist that you know that is super important in STEM. Most of the kids couldn't really point to someone because you know they, they, don't, they don't really know, these people don't advocate. And so 
I tell them about people like Belanda Addis. She's a, a chemist at L'Oreal. She's a black woman who makes a lot of money to develop hair care products for everybody that are come from L'Oreal. And so if you literally search things like black chemist, black scientist on Google, just like you search for your employer or anything else right before you go on that job interview, you can find anyone. Your role model today is a Google search away. And so like me being Mr. Fascinate, there's a ton of other folks out there that are role models for the next generation of young people. And so I want to give you all a glimpse into the future here. I've, like I said, I've worked with a lot of kids. I've seen the ambition these kids have. I've seen how capable they are with things like social media and uh, technology, just understanding it without even knowing where it came from. And I'm looking at the solution to the next pandemic, the solution to world hunger, right? Becoming a multi-planetary species, it requires a lot of these practical engineering solutions that right now might be trapped inside the mind of a young person that hasn't really seen STEM as a feasible career, hasn't seen it as something that was cool and fun and dope. And so my hope is that I like the spark in that kid and I aspire to inspire that kid to pursue a career in STEM. And so I hope that you all take what I've told you today and also like that spark in another kid. Thank you so much. My name is Justin Schaefer, again, also known as Mr. Fascinate, and I'd love to hear some of your questions. All right, thank you, Justin. And just a reminder, if you have questions for him, please put them in the Q&A and we will get to as many as uh, possible. So I wanna start off with a question about um, you mentioned your grandfather was really important to you and in, um, in your STEM uh, focus for your career. Is there anyone else who you think has been instrumental in changing your mind about STEM? Yeah, so I, honestly, I, I think a lot of my time, especially when I was in college, was spent um, doing that Google search and YouTube thing. You know, I didn't have a lot of clear role models uh, in STEM, you know, growing up and even in college, I met folks that looked like me that were scientists, but I didn't necessarily want to do exactly what they did. And so I watched like, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson interviews or Bill Nye, the science guy interviews. And, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, and myself not having a, a father figure in the household growing up, a lot of times I found myself being mentored by YouTube interviews. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I'm definitely not a sob story. I think that anyone can actually have the opportunity to learn from these people and, 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 and almost get like a sense of proximity to these people by learning how their mind works and, and watching some of these interviews that these people have on their various platforms. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question. Uh, this one's pretty specific. Um, so I don't know if you'll have the answer to this or not, but um, someone is asking if you could talk a little bit about dark matter and where black holes are, um, come from or what they're made from. <laughs> yes, I mean, I, I know that right now we're still trying to figure out exactly what dark matter is. And uh, we know that most of the, the material in the universe is comprised of dark matter. Now, black holes are a completely different phenomena. So uh, I'm actually just so happy to be really interested in this stuff. And, you know, basically a black hole, at least what we know of, is, is at is a, a singularity that um, basically is, is mass that has collapsed on itself. So you see that happening in the universe where there's stars that are super dense um, and they, they shrink down after they've uh, blown up. So the star becomes a red giant or a red super giant. That's a really, it starts off as a really large star and then it burns through all its fuel and compresses down in that process. And once it compresses down past a certain point where it actually can no longer compress down, it actually collapses in and of itself, goes supernova, and a black hole results. And that black hole uh, is actually very small, but it has extremely strong gravitational pull given its size. But th there's a theory out there that black holes can actually exist at various sizes and at various places in the universe. They don't just have to be collapsed stars. They could be black holes on Earth that we just don't know about because they're so small that they don't have a, that they have a negligible gravitational pull. Uh, so I know that's, you know, very high level stuff. I think that, you know, if you want to check out uh, some, I think one of my favorite channels that talks about black holes is um, Vsauce. Uh, he's one of my favorite YouTubers. And then there's Kurzgesagt out there as well. Uh, they, they do animations and things like that. But they talk a lot about neutron stars and black holes and the process of 
uh, finding out what dark matter and dark energy is as well. Great. Um, next question. What do you like best about your job? So I like the fact that I'm able to, you know, basically think for myself, make my own decisions. Uh, I wake up kind of when I want, as long as it's, you know, within a reasonable realm of, uh, of time and I work on my own time. So, you know, I pay my safe self based on the results that I produce and not necessarily on the amount of hours that I work. And so sometimes you find working at a nine to five job that you don't actually have to work from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. to produce the results. As a matter of fact, sometimes you could probably work from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. and produce those results if you really needed to. And so um, I'm able to kind of work in that style and, and work less but get more done. Uh, and so, you know, work less, less hours rather, but get more, more stuff done. And so uh, as someone that kind of thinks for myself and doesn't operate well in very stru structured environments, like I was a terrible employee. I worked in tech after my first, uh, after my science undergraduate degree. And I wasn't that good because I just don't really like structure that much. Uh, my brain doesn't function well unless I'm like completely free and open to think for myself. And so in my business now, I'm able to do that every single day. So that's probably my favorite thing. All right. We've got a couple questions rolling in specifically about uh, your job. So um, one is, uh, do you work with your STEM uh, friends or colleagues most of the time or do you tend to work by yourself most of the time? So I, I think I started off working by myself mostly, but I actually made a pact to myself at the beginning of 2021 that I'm around too many amazing STEM people. Like you saw some of the role models that, you know, I shared those, a lot of those people are my friends. And so, you know, the fact that I'm around these people and not working with them, at least at that time, I was like, that's, that's absolutely absurd. So, um, you know, these days, everything I'm doing is a collaborative project, ideally with a friend of mine, but sometimes with a colleague that, you know, is eventually going to become my friend. All right. And what was your first job working in STEM and was it as important and um, as good as the job that you have now? That's a good question. So sometimes I talk about this. So my first job uh, was technically an internship working in STEM. I was doing what's called a dolphin survey. I was in Savannah, Georgia. So I was 40 miles off the coast. We did what's called a research cruise for uh, three days and three nights. And I just sat there out in the open ocean looking for dolphins and, and reporting how many dolphins I observed. Uh, and I was getting paid to do that. And I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. <laughs> this is pretty cool for some research. Um, and then, and then I, just to, for more context, the next job I got right after that was at the White House working on the National Climate Assessment, you know, helping out with uh, observing the state of our climate in today's planet. Uh, and that was in 2015 or so, 14 or 15. And, um, and then after that, I worked in a research laboratory. And I would say that, you know, all those jobs were cool, but I think they were a little too structured and not public facing enough for me. So, you know, I, I found that, you know, while I was good at analyzing data and I was interested in the work I was doing, I always had a desire uh, to get out of the lab and, and talk to more people about science. And now I can talk to pretty much everybody about science. That's like my full-time job, my full-time life. Um, so I did, at the time, I didn't think it was actually a possible career path, but I figured out how to monetize it and sustain it, and I haven't looked back. This person asked, um, she's working on a project about computational biology, and she's wondering if you've had any experience with computational biology. I haven't had a ton of experience with computational biology. I, I've actually had some friends that work on, uh, I think they're programming different, like, I think I had a friend that was programming different nematodes to, uh, like, uh, move in different directions based on electrical signals that were um, trans transmitted through their bodies. But yeah, I don't have a lot of experience working in computational biology. And I think that's one of the interesting things about STEM is that, you know, I become like the STEM guy. And so uh, I don't think of myself as like an expert on every single STEM subject, but I think of myself as a generalist. Like I know a lot about um, a lot of different fields in STEM, but I always want to point to, uh, you know, folks that have a little more knowledge about something specific if they ask, for example, like a computational biology question or an astrophysics question. What is the field of science that fascinates you the most? Man, I, you know, I feel like every day is a little different. <laughs> like sometimes I wake up and I'm really like, I really feel like I should have been an entomologist, like someone who studies insects. And uh, 
Like, yeah, I actually like really had a stint there where I thought that was what I was going to do. And then there's some days where I look at marine science and like the deep sea and like all the, unex I guess the most unexplored part of our planet is the deep ocean. Like we probably don't know most of the species that exist down there. And I'm like, man, that's another opportunity to really like forge some new ground. But I think the thing that really inspires me the most is definitely astronomy. Um, you know, like this idea that, you know, we could become a multi-planetary species that we could terraform an entire planet potentially, and that there's other life out there. You know, these unresolved questions and these technical challenges are probably the thing that fascinates me the most. All right, this question, uh, in your talk, you mentioned conversational and verbal soft skills. Um, would you consider drawing or handwriting to be important foundational encoding skills for Gen Z? And could you talk a little bit about the A or the art part of that some people put into STEM to make it STEAM? Definitely. So I think the, anytime I'm running a program for kids, there's always a, 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 an art component to it, a creative component to it, I'd even suggest, where kids are, have the opportunity to create solutions to problems that they care about. And uh, specifically when you're thinking about handwriting and drawing, I think the next generation versions of those are typing speed. Uh, so working on your typing speed, your WPMs, words per minute, and that, and also graphic design. And I think those are absolutely pertinent foundational skills that every kid should be learning in class, whether that's like how to Photoshop, how to design a flyer. Um, you know, as an entrepreneur, that's a skill that I had to pick up. You know, I had to learn it kind of from YouTube and, uh, you know, figure stuff out. But from that, I've been able to build so many things, even if now some, a lot of times I'm hiring a graphic designer to maybe build a flyer for me or something like that, uh, or build a website for me, I know how to design a, a mock-up or a prototype of it so that I can give a clear sense of direction. I also know how much work it takes. And so I can make sure I'm not getting scammed, right? By someone that's trying to overcharge me. So, um, you know, those, so yeah, I'd say the equivalent of that now is typing and graphic design. Now, do I think that, it's, you know, you completely need to neglect uh, handwriting and drawing? No, I think that you should always know how to write. Like that's like a fundamental skill as well. Uh, and then if you want to maybe take your graphic design skills to drawing, you can still use your stylus on iPads and things like that. And so you know, that's still, you know, an opportunity for people to um, use graphic, learn and use graphic design skills for, for freehand drawing. But I actually design my, my best stuff. I used to draw as a kid. I design my best stuff now using a mouse uh, and, and, and graphic designing. So, um, yeah, and then I think the other question was, was also about, um, yeah, like the arts piece of STEM uh, and, and STEAM. And I think that every STEM field is arguably a creative field, right, uh, intrinsically. So uh, whether that's in science, when you're creating a laboratory experiment, right, that's a creative artistic process where you have to think about a hypothesis and how to disprove it and design a laboratory and, and design an experiment and make sure that it's fitting in the right parameters, right? That's not just like a calculated process purely. Uh, engineering, right? You have to build, literally creatively think and build a prototype. Sometimes a prototype is ugly and dysfunctional, but that's your first step. And that's a very creative process. And, you know, if you're not thinking creatively, then, you know, you're, you're basically setting up your STEM career to be that of a consumer uh, of technology as opposed to a producer of technology. So I always think that the arts are, are fundamentally important. But again, I'm thinking about Google search, right? And so when I think of myself as a STEM guide, I know that more people search for STEM than they do for STEAM. And so at the end of the day, I use that as my more common buzzword. Do you see yourself working in STEM for the rest of your life? Yeah, but and, and I think that's such a like, um, like, I, I say yes, because I think that it's, that it's, that means so many different things, right? Like working in STEM, like you literally can be almost anything in, in 2021, right? Like I could continue to speak to young people about STEM and be a speaker and that's STEM work. I could do science TV shows and that's STEM work. I could also build an app, a completely different mental process, completely different cognitive process and that's STEM work. I could be the CEO of a tech company and that's another completely different, you know, uh, set of skills and, and, and um, life experiences. And so, you know, I see, yeah, I'm just excited about this stuff. I wake up every day trying to learn about the new innovative stuff that's out there. And uh, my excitement hasn't gone away for, you know, my entire life yet. So I don't know. I don't know if there's anything else that I, I have as much passion and interest 
for as I do for, for STEM. And I, I don't know if I can see that fire burning out. All right, we've got just two more questions. Um, one is on your first job, did you see a lot of dolphins? Yeah, actually, um, in Savannah, we saw, I, I'd say a lot compared to what I, how many I thought. So I probably saw about, probably saw about five to 10 dolphins in the course of those three days. Uh, and this is like on a broad open ocean, like looking out, you know, in the, in the uh, expanses. And um, yeah, I didn't expect to see, I probably expected to see one. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then some, a lot of times dolphins are social species. And so they'll be traveling in what's called pods or groups uh, together. And so, yeah, we got to see a couple different dolphins together and they're super, super smart too. Uh, so that was, a, that was a really cool experience. All right, and the last question, what advice would you have for someone who is interested in STEM but doesn't really know where to start or what to do with it? You know, I would, I would take some time and, uh, and I think it depends on your age because uh, you could be interested in STEM as a kid and then you can go to like a summer camp and learn about all the different STEM careers. But if you're interested in STEM as an adult, I'd say like take yourself to YouTube and go down on a free trip. Like I said, your role model today is a Google search away. So if you're interested broadly in STEM, I would just Google, like, look, so what, a, what a scientist's career is. Uh, what does that consist of? What an engineer's career consist of? What a chemist's career consist of? What a pharmacist's career consist of? What a computer scientist, a software engineer, a data scientist? There's so many STEM careers that require broadly different skill sets and ways of thinking about the world. And so if you're able to take to Google search and, and just spend some time, maybe a day, just looking at everything. Uh, and I think you'll start to see one of those will probably stick out to you like a sore thumb. And if not, I'd say just keep learning uh, and, and keep exploring. A lot of things, one of the biggest things that, that is, is prominent in STEM, but less so in, in academic, uh, academia and school is really learning by, by failure, like failing forward. And, you know, in school, obviously a failure is like getting an F, uh, getting a 60% or lower uh, a lot of times in your class. But if my prototype, if the thing I just created is 60%, right? That's actually pretty good in STEM. Um, but of course, you learn, to do, you learn to iterate. You learn to keep you know, failing forward and improving upon the last design and, and making everything better and better and better um, at, you know, at each time. And so um, it's a completely different process than like turning in the best thing first in academia. And you know, in, in, in STEM, we, our first draft is always going to be ugly, almost, and that's okay. That's inspiring. And then, in, you know, in my and even in my work, a lot of the stuff I did in, in the beginning, my first cartoon, my first drawings, my first uh, you know business endeavor, all ugly. And then a couple of times, a couple of iterations, they started to get they started to get cool. So um, I would definitely say just yeah, um, start start somewhere and iterate and and just figure it out as you go. That's what we all do in STEM. Great. All right. That's all the time that we have for questions. I want to thank you, Justin, for joining us today. I want to thank uh, those of you that are in our virtual audience. Um, you will receive an email with a link to view this webinar in the coming weeks. In the meantime, we hope that you'll check out the rest of the events and activities that we have happening this weekend during virtual STEMCon. That can be found at cod.edu slash STEMCon, or the link has also been added into the chat if you'd like to go directly there. This concludes today's presentation. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope that you have a great day. Thank you all.